handshake song so we can fellowship one with another soon and very soon.
last song this morning is going to be 207. Surely goodness and mercy. God tells us that goodness and mercy is going to follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And that's what we're going to do, aren't we? If you're saved today, your destination is heaven with our Father. Amen. So if you can stand, let's all sing page 207. A pilgrim was I and a wandering In the cold night of sin I did roam When Jesus the kind shepherd found me And now I am on my way home Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the day Bibles, if you turn to Acts chapter 20, amen. good to be in God's house, say amen. amen. Let me try that again. It's good to be in God's house, say amen. amen. There you go. You don't have to be Pentecostal, but you don't have to be asleep either, you know. <laughs> amen. Good to be saved. Uh, a couple of announcements real quick. Let me see. We got Men's Cornhole uh, October 13th at 6 o'clock, so be here that 6 o'clock. Warm up and sign up, and uh, uh, I think uh, New London Baptist is going to be with us. Some of the men there is going to challenge us to some cornhole, so we're going to have a good time for that. Uh, ladies Painting, October 14th at 1 o'clock. Sign up sheets on the front. Uh, ladies Bible Study, November 4th. At, Sister Joanne, is that right, November 4th? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, tonight, uh, we're going to jump into a Bible study. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I'm going to uh, introduce the Bible study just to whet your appetite a little bit to be here tonight. I, uh, years ago, I was, uh, uh, was door knocking down in Elkton uh, and ran into a lady named Gina. And I asked her, I said, uh, uh, are you going to heaven when you die? And she said, uh, she goes, yeah, I, I think so. I'm pretty sure I am. And uh, I, so I asked the second question. What I always ask, well, if you died today and you stood before God and God asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would your answer be? And she looked at me and she goes, I keep all five of the, of the sacraments. And I said, oh, I said, so you're, you're Catholic. And she said, yeah, I'm, I'm Catholic. I said, oh, praise the Lord. And I said, I said, um, I said so, but I said, I understand there's seven sacraments. And she, she looked at me. She goes, there is? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I said, I'm not Catholic, but I, I believe there's seven. She goes, she goes, oh, my. I said, you mean if you die today, you'd be two sacraments short? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, she got this worried look on her face. Super nice lady. And uh, we, we invited her to the church. And, uh, and uh, she, uh, she came to church, actually came to church because of that. Uh, now, I don't know if she ever got saved. She, she came off and on a little bit. And, uh, uh, but I got to thinking about that. I, um, 
Uh, tonight, my, my Bible study is going to be answering Catholicism. Now, I'm going to say this. I'm not attack, attacking Catholics. I love Catholics. I'm, I married into a bunch of them. Uh, what we're going to be looking at is Catholic doctrine. And I want to do something fun. I did something a little different we never did before. Uh, I was on Facebook, and they got these little things called reels. It's like 90-second videos. And, uh, and I come across a Catholic apologetics uh, uh, Facebook page, and they have all these little uh, reels, little mini videos that defend their doctrine, things like uh, baptismal regeneration, uh, infant baptism, uh, 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 the assumption of Mary, all these things. And I'm just going through, I'm like, that's, that's not right. That, that's not right. <laughs> that, and so I, you know, I decided I'm going to download these videos. I'm going to bring them tonight, and we're going to play one at a time. And I'm going to see how the class reacts to the videos. What, as you look at it, what would be your biblical answer? Now, uh, again, I use that example of, of Gina when I got to witness to her. Uh, it's good when it, you're a soul winner, or you may have family members or, or friends, or co-workers or whatever uh, into this, it's good to have an answer, uh, a biblical answer, in a loving, kind uh, of a manner to be able to show them where uh, you know, there's some flaws in their doctrine. And, and I'm not bashing a, a, a denomination or anything like that, but I think it's good to know what they believe and why and understand what we believe biblically to be able to give an answer because why? Heaven is a sweet place. And I want everybody there. Uh, so, so be here at 5 o'clock tonight. We're going to have some fun with that. I, I got 20 videos. Uh, I don't, we, we won't get through near as many as uh, that, but we're going to just play them and discuss, look at the Scripture, see what the Bible says, and just have a really good time with that. So be here tonight at 5 o'clock. All right, I'm going to preach now. Uh, I'm going to preach on a, a topic. Here's my title, Protecting Your Faith. Protecting your faith. Let me, let me introduce the, the, the sermon a little bit. I, uh, there's an urban legend about a guy named Mervyn Grzynski. Uh, he, uh, he bought a Winnebago and went on a cruise. Uh, on, and it, for the first time he went out, he set it on cruise control thinking it was autopilot. And he walked away from the wheel, uh, according to the story, and went back. And, uh, of course, uh, auto cruise is not, uh, our, our, isn't uh, uh, autopilot. And, uh, of course, as he went back to have a cup of coffee, the thing ran off the road. And uh, he wound up, according to the legend, he sued Winnebago for $1.75 $1. million uh, because he, they should have advertised it better. He thought, you know what, all I got to do is set it on cruise control and go back and have coffee. You know, and I don't know whether the story or not is true. I've seen it all over the internet. But, you know, a lot of people get saved and they think Christianity is like that. You can just set it on auto cruise or autopilot or whatever and just go back and chill. Uh, but that's not how, it's, how Christianity is. Uh, I know a lot of preachers, false prophets preach that. The prosperity cro uh, gospel says, you know what, if you just live holy enough, you know, if you give them enough money on TV, you know, you'll never be sick, your bank account will be filled, and life will be just a, a, you know, a bunch of roses for them anyway, not you. <laughs> you know, that's what they teach. You got the ear ticklers that says, well, you know what? If, if, you, if you do this and this, you can have your best life now, you know, that, that you never have any troubles. And, I, and them are such deadly teachings because you come to the table expecting Christianity to be like that, and it's not like that. Life is tough. Uh, you know, for the Christian life, it's not easy. The devil is always trying to get us to slip up and mess up, get us into sin. And then sometimes even God's plans don't line up with our plans and things don't make sense. And some of these things sometimes can shake your faith. And I want to talk about that tonight. I, I, I would hope the goal of everyone here, first of all, I hope everybody's saved. And if you're saved, I would hope everybody here wants to finish your race here on this earth strong. I would hope every one of our desires would be to stand before Jesus Christ one day and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And this morning I want to preach on these things as a warning sign that may shake your faith up a little bit so we can be better prepared when some of these things come. So if you've got your Bibles open, I'm going to look at a story. Acts, Acts chapter 20. If you're able to stand, please stand. We're going to read verses 17 down through 24. Acts 20, verse 17. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is having a meeting with some of the pastors here at, at the church at Ephesus. And in verse 17, let's just pick up. He says, and from Miletus, he said, he sent, get this, to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, ye know from, get this, from the first day that I came to Asia, after what manner I've been with you at, uh, at all seasons. Look at this. He says, verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, 
and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. What he's saying, he said, he said it wasn't always easy being a missionary, you know. He said, every town I went to, the, the Jews were lying in wait, waiting to capture me, waiting to put him in jail, waiting to beat him and all this stuff. He said, this has been my ministry, he said. Verse 20, he says, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you and have taught you publicly from house to house. He said, I went soul winning. I went you know, building this church here in Ephesus. Verse 21, he says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now look at verse 22. He said, now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. He says, I know what it's been like, and I'm going to Jerusalem, and this is just before he's going to get captured. He says, I don't even know what's going to happen there. He, and he said, and look at, he says, verse 23, Save the Holy Ghost, witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and affliction abide in me. Doesn't sound like his best life now, does it? <laughs> Doesn't sound like health and wealth preaching, does it? He said, this is going to be tough. But look at, he says, verse 24, here's my text. But none of these things move me. Neither count my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel uh, of grace of God. Father, feed us this morning. I pray and ask, Lord, that everything said and done here, you get the glory. Father, I pray and ask, if somebody here this morning is not saved, I pray and ask today be the day where they call on you to be saved. And Father, we'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maybe seated. Paul calling this this meeting with all the preachers there at Ephesus, he, he wanted to encourage them to stay in the ministry. He knows his time is coming short by this time. He knows he's, he's not got a whole lot of time left. Uh, verse 19, he says, with many tears and temptations which befell me in the lying of the way of the Jews. He's telling them and reflecting. I think that's a good idea. He wasn't saying, you know what, if you just give enough money, you're going to have your best life now. You'll be rich. And, uh, the, this modern day charismatic preaching is foreign from the Bible. That's not what Paul preached at all. He said, I know where I've been. He said, I know what I've been through. And then he gets down to, to uh, uh, verse 22 and he says, And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall uh, befall me there. He said, he said, I know what it's been like. I know what I'm going to. And then he says in verse 23 that the Holy Ghost witnessed that in every city saying that bounds and affliction abide in me. He, basically, that's been his calling. But, but, but he says, he looks at this in verse 24. He says, none of these things move me. I like that. As a preacher, he says nothing moved him to question God's calling. Nothing moved him to think about quitting. You know, I think I'm done with this church planning thing. You know, it was, it was more fun being a Pharisee. <laughs> none, of the thing. He, he did, none of them things moved him to question God's sovereignty in all of this. Don't we, when we go through a trial, don't we wonder sometimes, you know, God, are you there? God, are, are, are you still in control? He said none of these things, all the trials and affliction and personal things that he was going through, he said none of these things moved me. He said I stayed faithful. I want to finish my course all the way to the end. Christian, let me say this. We walk by faith. That's the way we've called to do. But when that faith gets shaken, it's really easy sometimes to say, you know what, I think I'm done with all this. I think I'm moving on, going back to my personal life, and just this stuff is too hard. And, you know, when, and when our faith is getting shaken, it's easy to quit, and it's easy to be open up to satanic attacks. This morning, what I want to do, I want to preach, and here's my outline, five ways your faith can be challenged. Five ways which your faith can be challenged. I dug through the Bible. I found a few examples I want to look at this morning as basically warning signs. So we can look and say, you know what? These things the Bible talked about, and these are the things I'm going to watch out so my faith isn't shaken as well. Let's jump right in. Number one, first thing I see here is when church people hurt you. You know, church is supposed to be a nice place. <laughs> church should be a place where we come and get, and get fed the Word of God. Church ought to be a place where we come and get encouraged in our walk. Church ought to be a place where we're held accountable so we stay faithful unto God. Church ought to be a place where we feel like family when we come in. Praise God, I honestly can say that. I said this Wednesday night, I feel like state line's there. I don't think we're perfect, but we're well on our way. And I appreciate that, I love that. But unfortunately, sometimes church isn't always like that. Sometimes church can have some people who can be judgmental in it. Sometimes church can have people that can be a little bit of gossipy. Sometimes people can be busybody. Sometimes people can be in church can be prideful. You know, sometimes church people, let's just say it, can be plain mean. 
It happens. Uh, matter of fact, if I ask for a raise of hands, don't raise your hand. But if you've been in church long enough, I bet you've experienced some of that. You know? <laughs> They're all keeping down. You know? it, that's the way it is. That's because church you know, is made up of different people. Uh, let me give a couple of biblical examples. If you would turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Look at a couple of biblical examples of some good church people just not using their head a little bit. Mark chapter 10, Jesus is sitting and, and some people wanted to bring their kids to Jesus. I mean, that's a good thing. They didn't send their kids to, to church. They were bringing their kids to church. That's the way it ought to be. You don't send your church on the, or kids on the church bus. Bring them. Uh, and, and, uh, if you don't have a ride, hey, we got a church van. We can bring you and the kids at the same time. But they were coming to Jesus, and they wanted Jesus to be part of their life. And, and look down at Mark chapter 10, verse 13. It says, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. Now, look at the church people. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. Rebuke means they, they lit them up, you know. <laughs> they said, get them kids out of here. We got some business, and you're bringing those kids uh, here. I mean, uh, that's, that's kind of me. Can you imagine coming to State Line, and, and Brother Ralph's out there, and you got your kids. We said, what are you doing bringing those kids to church? Get those kids out of here. <laughs> you know? You'd be like, what? You know, that, that deacon's mean there at that church, you know. And, and that's kind of what they were doing. They were like, yeah, we got business to take care of. Look down at verse 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased <gasps> with church people. Can you imagine that? <laughs> he, said, it says, he said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. Uh, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Teach them a little bit of lesson. Look at verse 16. And he took them up in his arms and put his hands upon them and bless them. Church ought to be for old people, middle-aged people, and for kids too, right? It's all, everybody. And that's what the lesson there Jesus was taught. Folks, let me tell you something. A church is made up of a lot of different people. You got baby Christians, you know. You got carnal Christians, unfortunately, sometimes. You know, you got mature Christians. You know, you got Christians that had good days coming in. You got Christians coming in sometimes having bad days. Yeah, don't raise hands now, but you ever got in a fight on the way to church? <laughs> you got to walk in with that fake smile and you just beat somebody up in the car. You know? <laughs> you know? we, have, we have those days, you know. I'd be, I'd be the first one to raise hands, you know. You got to come in and put that smile on. Sometimes it's not easy to put that smile on. I'll give you an example. Years ago, I remember when Pastor Wyatt was pastoring, and Pastor Wyatt was one of the guys, he would give you the shirt off his back. I mean, he was just that kind of preacher, you know, just loved everybody. And, uh, and there toward the end, he, the melanoma was kind of taken over, and he had a couple of spots that was kind of sore. There was a teenager in our church at that time. He was a little bit ornery. <laughs> Remember, he's a lot ornery. And, uh, and he seen him one day walking in, and he walked up and gave him a big old bear hug, and accidentally kind of touched one of those spots. And for just a second, Pastor Wyatt kind of got a little aggravated, grabbed a hold of him, and was like, oh, I better put him down. <laughs> realize what he was at come to himself a little bit and I got to thinking about that if somebody would have took a snapshot of that right there maybe somebody like in our generation had a cell phone and then they put it on the you know the Facebook page look how horrible this preacher is you know everybody would form an opinion based on that two seconds of his life you know he'd be the worst preacher in the world no matter what else he did you know we have bad days we come into church no church is perfect you know uh, and we can all do some things that are not smart but unfortunately Sometimes when we're mean uh, and, and we have those days, we can shake people's faith. Uh, let me give you another example. Um, not all church people are saved. You know, sometimes the devil comes in and sits in the pews. You know, <laughs> sometimes lost people come in for sure. And uh, I, I want to give you an example. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, Paul's talk, uh, writing a letter to Timothy, and he's talking about a fellow uh, named Alexander. Now listen to what he says. Verse 19 he says, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. He said there's some that he knows in church that veered away from the word of God and kind of went off on their own. And he mentions two guys, verse 20, he says, of whom Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So these were two, I believe, not saved people in the church, and Paul had to deal with them. Delivering them to Satan means kind of separated fellowship with them a little bit, the church did, and they didn't like it, evidently. They got kind of mad, because you get to uh, the second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, verses 14 and 15, uh, scholars say this is the same Alexander. Verse 14, Paul says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. 
uh, the Lord reward him according to his works. Verse 15 says, Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. So you put Bible with Bible, if this is the same guy, evidently Paul had to deal with him in the first letter. By the time the second letter comes, this guy got bitter. He got mad, and he, as a matter of fact, he was out, uh, you know, fighting against the work of the church and everything that Paul was doing. And, and I believe that was a lost person that came into the church, and the preacher had to deal with him, and he got bitter, and he went and just ripped everybody up on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. So you know that happened before, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, sometimes people can be mean in church. And I know when you come to church and you're expecting church to be good and expecting something out, and all of a sudden somebody in the church hurts you, that can shake your faith. And you know something? I've seen people come to church. Unfortunately, I've seen people get hurt in church. But I've seen people walk away and say, I'm done with God. I'm done with church. And I know people to this day have had that happen to them and won't step foot in the church anywhere. I'm going to say this. Don't never let a backslidden or carnal Christian drive you out of God's house. Don't never let. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to finish this race. I don't care how mean people are to me. I'm just going to bless them, love them, hug their neck. I'm going to, but you know what? Ain't no carnal backslidden Christian going to keep me out of God's church. Ain't no carnal backslidden uh, a Christian or even a Christian having a bad day is going to shake my faith enough to stay out of God's house, out of God's church, and all the blessings that God has with it. When, when, you, when somebody does that to you, and I've seen it happen, just say, praise the Lord, God loves you, and give it to God. We preached on this Wednesday night, and God will handle it for you when church people are mean. Number two, let's move on. Second thing I found in Scripture, when God calls you to do something that doesn't make sense. Now, he will do this. I'm going to say this. I can guarantee you, <laughs> if you're willing to step up and follow God's calling in your life, it's going to sometimes not make sense. I want to look at a couple of biblical examples. In Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to look at Abraham as an example. God made a promise to Abraham. Now, we've been looking at this as we study eschatology, the Abrahamic covenants. By the way, watch Israel. Things are going on right now. Woo! Yeah, that, I'm looking for that dome of the rock come down, the temple going, and we're out of here. You know? <laughs> Things are looking interesting. But he made promises to Abraham uh, that there was going to be uh, a threefold promise. And one of the promises was there was going to be a nation came out from his descendants. All right, So that was a promise. And, and Abraham said, all right. But the problem is some time went by. And, uh, and now Abraham's 100 years old. The promise hasn't come through yet. Sarah's 90 years old by the time. The promise still hasn't come through. They're waiting on their child to come. And... Uh, uh, and, and finally, God says in Genesis, was it, I got it written down, Genesis 18, we ain't got time, 9 through 15, okay, you're going you're gonna to have a child. Now, Abraham's 100 years old, Sarah's 90. Anybody here 90 planning on having kids? Raise your hand. You know? <laughs> you know? Sarah laughed a little bit, and, and, and God's like, did you laugh? She's like, no, I didn't laugh. You know, you know, but she did. She doubted you. But God, see, God overlooked the natural circumstances there. And, of course, she had a child at 90 years old. You, know? uh, they, you don't look for formula and baby diapers at 90 years old. But it, you know, everything is possible with God. God you know, and, and they had this kid. But the craziness didn't stop yet. You get to Genesis chapter 22, and God calls Abraham to do something that kind of doesn't make sense. And ver let me read you in verse 1. It says, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Verse 2 says, And he said, Get this, take now thine only son, or thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now, now, wait a minute, God. <laughs> you promised me a child. You waited until it was impossible. So you show your strength and praise God for that. And now I got to go offer him as a sacrifice. I thought, where's this nation going to come from? You know, <laughs> you know. I'm, you know, but it didn't shake Abraham's faith. You know, yeah. So he, 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 God had a plan. And so he goes up, and then he's going. He's willing to do what God says. It didn't make sense, but God used that situation to this day to paint the picture of the lamb that He would provide, and we see that in the story. See, but Abraham didn't know that at that time. He didn't know we'd be here, at State Line Baptist, in 2023, talking about Jesus and the lamb that was provided. He didn't know any of that. It didn't make any sense. All he knew is, okay, that don't make sense. Where's this nation going to come from if I kill him? You know, he had enough faith. You know what? God will just raise him from the dead. See, but he didn't let him shake his faith. 
Sometimes, Christian, God will call you to do some things that just doesn't add up. But don't let it shake your face. Step into that dark room. Do what God tells you to do and watch the light come on and God will reveal his will in your life. Let me give you another example. I got so many, but these two are really good. In uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah uh, and the, well, this poor widow. God says this. Let me read you. I'll just read it so you don't have time to turn there. Verse 9. He told him, he says, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs, uh, belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Get this. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. Stop. Uh, wait a minute. I'm hungry. <laughs> Aren't you going to send me to a rich guy? You know, maybe he owns a bakery, you know. <laughs> You're going to send me to... They don't normally have a lot of money, God. And God says, don't worry. She's going to take care of it. Verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, that I may drink. Verse 11. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And listen to what she says. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat and die. <laughs> in other words, she says, this is all I got. Now, God called him to a ministry, and I'm going to take care of you, and you're going to, wait a minute, you're going to send me to a widow that basically just cooked her last meal and she's going to die, <laughs> you know? But God did that because God's calling was going to show his power in that God didn't need a rich person. He could take care of Elijah through a, through a widow that didn't have anything. He was going to take care of it. Folks, let me tell you something. I, I use those two stories, two stories, and I can give you a whole many more stories that God's power is there no matter what your earthly situation is. If God called you to it, he'll get you through it. God will give you the power to do whatever he's called you. We don't serve a God that says, I want you to do it, but good luck, figure a way out. God's already got a plan in my life, and God called me to preach, you know? At 30 years old, I felt the calling, and I got to thinking when I was 30 years old, feeling the calling to preach, I'm like, I don't like getting up in front of people. I just don't like it. That's not me. I didn't like it. You know, I, I hated to read. I still hate to read. I like the book, but give me, if, if you give me a book, say, preacher, read this, I promise you, it'll sit in my book till the rapture happens. I just don't read. You know? I'm, and I'm thinking about this. I don't like to read. I'm pretty sure preachers read. You know, They have to. You know, I didn't like that. I didn't go to Bible college at that time. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm, like, I'm not like them other guys. I went to seminary and go to you know, 15 years of college. I didn't do that. I, I, grew, I didn't grow up in church. I never went to youth group. Uh, we, we was the Easter Christians. I wasn't even the Christmas Christians. I mean, they were talking this morning, like maybe a Methodist church or two in my past, and that's it. And I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm saved. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find your will. And you want me to preach? I, I can't do this, Lord. <laughs> and that was what was going through my mind. I wouldn't even tell anybody. When there was somebody, we talked about preaching, I felt it inside me. I wanted to do it more than anything else because that was the calling God had in my life. But it didn't make any sense. So I didn't tell anybody for years and years and years. But you know something? Me standing here is just plain and simple the work of God. And I'm not bragging on myself and I'm going to say I'm somebody special. But folks, let me tell you something. When God calls you to do something and you can't see any way to get it done financially, physically, mentally, spiritually, don't worry about it. Don't let it shake your faith. Just go do it and God will supply a way. He does it. Number three. Let's move on. This will shake your faith. When your focus gets off God, turn to Matthew chapter 14. Famous story, Matthew 14. When your focus gets off God. The popular story where Peter is walking on the water. Let's draw some points here. Matthew chapter 14. Go down to verse 22. We're going to pick up on the story. I'll wait for the pages to stop turning. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. you got to say amen. amen. Verse 22, it says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. All right? Get in the boat, guys. Go take off. I'll meet you. I'll meet you on the other side. Verse 23, he says, uh, And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Even Jesus needed time by himself. Even Jesus needed some time with him and the Father. It says, when the evening was come, he was there alone. 
But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, uh, for the wind was contrary. And I get the picture. I bet that was scary. Now, these are experienced men on the water. They knew what they were doing, but the water was getting pretty rough. It says, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Can you imagine that? You know, Jesus like saying, oh, it's about time. You know, <laughs> They're probably wondering, how are you going to get to the other side? You Don't worry about it. I'll get there. You know, Jesus comes walking on the water. Uh, verse 26, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out with fear. You know, the, you know, the, can you imagine me? It's the middle of the night, all right? <laughs> you know, the waves are going all over the place. And all of a sudden you look out and somebody's walking on the water. They, I mean, they didn't say, oh my, look, it's a spirit. <laughs> Said they cried. They go, ah! You know, they were, they were freaking out pretty much, all right? And verse 27, but straightway Jesus spake unto them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Verse 28, now look at Peter. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if, thou, if, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee under the water. Now, you can criticize Peter all you want. I'd have been, I just said, you know, just, just get in the boat, you know, call him that water. You know? <laughs> Peter, he's a little rambunctious, you know. He's like, you know what, let me come out there with you. Criticize him all you want. You wouldn't have got out of the boat either. If you've ever been a fisherman, been out on rough water, I don't get out of the boat when it's calm, you know. And Peter said, you know, I'll get out, all right. Verse 29, and he said, come, watch out when you ask Jesus. <laughs> don't ask him for a ministry you ain't willing to step out and do, all right. And it says, and when Peter was come down uh, out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now stop for a minute. Say, well, big deal. Try filling your bathtub up. See how far you can get. Just get one step. See how far you get, all right? He, got, he, he walked on the water, all right? Verse 30, uh-oh. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now I want you to get the picture. It's, it's the fourth watch, all right? It's, I looked that up. That's roughly 3 to 6 o'clock in the morning. I, if you've ever been out fishing at night, the water changes when it gets dark, you know? It's a totally different world. This, you know, now this is late, late, late in the night, and the storm is rocking this boat back and forth, and the disciples uh, look out on the water. They see Jesus. They think it's the Spirit. He calms them down. Peter asks, can I walk out on the water? He steps out. He begins to walk on the water, and he's walking, but all of a sudden, what's he do? He takes his eyes off the Savior and starts to look all around him and seeing the waves and the wind and he got afraid and that was at that point in time when he began to sing I believe if he'd have kept his eyes on Jesus he'd have walked straight on out and they'd have walked right back to the boat together I believe that but what he did and don't criticize him he got out of the boat but there was a time in his life where all of a sudden the storms become greater than his Savior he got his eyes off of the Savior and the storms were still there and, and he took his eyes off the Savior he started looking at all the troubles in his life that's when he began to sink. Christian, let me tell you something. The mo I, I promise you, life is not easy. Life is full of storms. And the moment you get your eyes off the Savior and start focusing on the storms more than the Savior, that's when you're going to begin to sink. That's what happened to Peter. When I first started pastoring, You've heard my testimony, my pastoring testimony. I took a church, and I'm not criticizing the church. Good people here when I took it, for sure. Loved every single one of them. But it was a divided church, and I knew it was not going to be easy. I knew it was going to be tough. I knew it was going to be hard getting people on the same page. This person had an idea of going, the church going this way. That person had an idea of the church going that way. And when Pastor White stepped down, there was, there was nobody pastoring the church for almost a year. And for a year, that stuff festered. And, and you could just see it in the church. The church was going every which way but loose. And I knew when I, when I threw my hat in the ring, when I take this, it's going to be tough. And boy, was it. I had people that I loved dearly get mad at me. I had people that I, I thought was there to the end get mad and leave. Uh, you know, and as a pastor, that was really tough. There ain't nothing worse than getting a, a, a call. I'm, going, I'm leaving. You know, and especially when you're new to the ministry. And I'm going through all that. And trust me, as a pastor, that's a storm. That's hard to go through. And in the midst of all that, my mom takes her life literally six months after I stepped into that talk about a storm man the winds were blowing hard my, my mom hadn't been gone a month my dad started getting terminally sick and then for the next 10 months I would study sermons on my laptop at, at, a, at, a, at a nursing home down in, in, uh, in, in on Pike Creek and just sit there by his side listening to the breathing machines trying to keep air in his lungs while I'm trying to write sermons I'm at the same time I can remember one time specifically trying to put out a church fight 
while I'm by my dad's side trying to write a sermon at the time. And I'm a greenhorn just starting into this. And then, and then uh, 10 months of that going from, from the, the nursing home to the emergency room, getting calls in the middle of the night, and I know i got to get up and go to church the next morning. I literally had a wedding to do, and I get a call. He's probably not going to make it through the weekend, but I had a wedding to do at the same time. You know, this is going through my life. Then he passes away, and it isn't a year later my sister gets to the call of terminal cancer and folks let me tell you something uh, and then I was by her side watching her dwindle down to nothing but flesh and bone and then to die uh, you know she was only 45 years old I'm the only one left folks let me tell you something I, there was times in my life where it was really easy to get my eyes off the Savior and get my eyes on the storm going on around me but I can trust you I mean trust me on this trust me if I had got my eyes and started looking on all the problems you wouldn't see me here today I'd be back swinging a hammer, building houses, you know, miserable as could be. But God got me through that. Why? Because I kept my eyes on the Savior. Christian, let me tell you something. Life is not easy. Life is full of storms and winds, and, and life will throw you everywhere. But trust me, keep your eyes on the Savior. He'll keep you walking on the water till you get to Him. And then, he, well, if you read the end of the story, He got in the boat, and He calmed the storm. That's what you got to do. Hang tight, stay with him, and keep your eyes on the Savior. Number four, let's move on. Number four, this will shake your faith. When the heathen seems to be winning, and you're not. <laughs> That'll shake your faith right there. Uh, turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Let me get there. Elijah, in uh, verse chapter 18, popular story on Mount Carmel, just one of unbelievable battle all right i mean mount carmel uh he, he he stood up called fire down from heaven i mean that's a pretty good day <laughs> yeah yeah, uh, yeah if i if i could do that i'd just do it right here you know it's like watch this you know called fire down from heaven you know he he he, he defeated the prophets of baal you know he, he called up and had them slaughtered, you know. It was, it's a good day when, you know, you slaughter some Baal prophets, you know. <laughs> it's a good day. But we get to chapter 19, you know, old Jezebel, you know, she wasn't happy about this. You know, she, uh, you know, Ahab may have been the king, but Jezebel was, was really the ruler. It's kind of like Bill and Hillary going on, you know. And uh, you know, she was, you know, he may have been the king, but she really ruled the roost. And she got mad, you know. And uh, let's just, let's read chapter 19. Let's read the first eight verses. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Uh, then Hillary, uh, Hillary, I mean Jezebel, uh, sent messengers unto Elijah saying, so, get this, so let the gods do to me and more also if I uh, make not my life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So she's unleashing evil at this point in time. She's mad as a hornet. Watch out when you get an evil queen mad, you know. And she's mad. And she's, she said, I want, I want him dead. Kill him right now. Uh, and she's, she's turning the kingdom loose. Can you imagine? Just, you know, just Cecil County mad at you, you know. <laughs> Everybody's going to kill you. You know, and that's kind of what he's, he's, he's facing. Verse 3. It says, when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, where, uh, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Verse 4, get this, but he himself, you know the story, went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, get this, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. He did like Peter. He got his eyes off the storm, uh, got off the Lord and got it on the storm. He's depressed. His faith was shaken. Verse 5, it says, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, get this, the, then an angel touched him and said, and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on coals and a cruise of water and his head, uh, 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 of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. The angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. So here you get the picture. Elijah is, uh, has won this massive battle. King ah 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 Ahab had told his wife she unleashed fury on him for the next, she said, next 24 hours he's got to die. Elijah can't run for his life. He hides under the juniper tree. His faith was shaken. I believe his faith was shaken in God. He says, it is enough, God. You ever got that point in time in your life where you say, it is enough, God? You know, you know The evil around him is winning. Hey, yo, I think at that point in time, I really do, Elijah was questioning God's sovereignty. 
He's looking around and seeing evil people around him winning, and he's losing. But what he didn't understand, God had a plan. Amen. God nourished him up. God said, just hang in there, man. Hang in there. I know right now evil seems to be winning, but just hang in there. I got 7,000 men you don't even know about. Hasn't bowed the knee to any evil. And, and, and they're going to be right by your side. Matter of fact, Jezebel, <laughs> she ain't going to be around much longer. <laughs> she's going to be she's going to be tossed out a window. Horses is going to trample on her. And they ain't even going to be able to find her bodies. Dogs are going to eat her. You know what? After about 24 hours, what she's going to turn into? <laughs> Dog poo. <you> know? <laughs> That's what the Bible said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not exactly a respectable burial. Okay? Yeah. But that's what she got. But there was a point in time in Elijah's life where he felt like evil was going to lose. Christian, you are going to win. And you're on the losing side. Christian, have you ever looked around you and you see people that don't follow God? They're living in sin. They're partying it up. And yeah, you look around, they drive nicer cars than you. They're living in better homes than you. They're taking nicer vacations than you. And, and they're living in open sin, don't care about God. And here you are, you go to church every Sunday, every Wednesday. You support the work of the Lord. You tie, you give to missions. You serve in ministries every since the day you got saved. You do, you're faithful to God. You pray, you read your Bible, you raise your family up the way they ought to be. You've been there and you look around and, and they're, they're thriving. But yet you're strong. Struggling. That will shake your faith. That will make you say, well, wait a minute. But un let understand something for sure. Just hang on, Christian. God has a plan, and evil is about to get trampled by a horse. One day, Jesus is coming back. One day, he's going to come and he's going to rule with the rod of iron. One day, we're going to be up in heaven while this world's just going to be whatever the devil wants to do. One day, we're going to rule and reign with him a thousand years. One day, we're going to spend an eternity and we never have to look at it. Evil has an hour. It is true. Right now, we look around. Evil does seem to be winning. But one day, King Jesus is coming back. And this world isn't going to, be, be going to be shocked at what they're going to face. Because we may feel like we're on the losing side. But trust me, King Jesus is still on the throne. And he knows exactly what's going on. Jezebel fell. And trust me, Jezebel is going to fall again. Read Revelation if you want to see more. Let's move on. Last one. Number five. Number five. This will shake your faith. When ungodly people try to give you counsel. This is a good one. Say amen. The story of Job is a fascinating story. Uh, God allowed the devil to attack Job. He lost his kids. He lost his finances. He lost his servants. He lost his health. And the only thing he got to keep was a nagging wife. That's all he got. Rough life for Job. Yeah, 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 God allowed trials to come in his life. Why? Not to be mean, but he had, he had a purpose in that to where we could use this story and to use his trials uh, to glorify uh, God. I mean, that was all there. And, and, and afterwards, God blessed him. Job chapter 42, verse 10. He gave him twice as much as what he had. But the interesting thing through this whole story, Job had three friends that were ungodly. And they come and they got to convince, oh, Job, you're in sin. <laughs> you know, you just need to repent and get right with God. They were assuming what they, what they thought God was, wanted in his life. You know, and, 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 and all through the book, they're just like, you know, if you just want to give God blood, you just confess that sin. And Job, and that's the whole book. They're going back and forth. Folks, let me tell you something. Uh, uh, ungodly people will cause you to stray away from your faith. Uh, God dealt with those ungodly friends. Let me read you Job 42, verse 7. And it says, and it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said unto uh, Eliphaz, he says, the Temite, he says, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken, get this, of me the thing that is right, and as my servant Job, Job hath. Christian, let me tell you something. Don't live, we don't live in a Christian bubble. You know, we don't, you know, it's, it's not like we're around uh, Christian people all the time. You know, you go to school, I'm sure you probably got some ungodly friends. You go to work, you got some ungodly people you work around. You probably got some ungodly neighbors. You got some, you got uh, ungodly people all around you. And then unfortunately, sometimes even people that says they're Christian but living ungodly. And they will always try to give you advice in your life and marital advice. You don't need him. I bet there's better men out there than you, you know, than him. You don't need her. 
you know, that girl would treat you a whole lot better than that wife you got, you know? Yeah, you, you, know, you, know you, don't, you don't need to go to that church every Sunday when the rockfish are popping like crazy out there on Sunday mornings. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. You know, and, and they'll give you a, a counsel that will contradict what, what God says. They'll, they'll give you advice. Folks, let me tell you something. The worst thing you could ever do, Christian, is to listen to the counsel of an ungodly person. Turn off CNN. Don't go to them secular colleges or public school system that's going to uh, uh, try to educate you out of what God's Word says. Walk not. Let me, let me read you. Uh, Psalms 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sinneth, sinneth in the sea of the scornful. Get this. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. Christian, when somebody comes to you and tries to give you counsel, and it's different from the word of God, you look at the Bible and says, no, thank you. This is my fact checker right here. This is my truth of source right here. An ungodly person that steers you away from God is going to steer you away from your faith and get you right into trouble every single time. When I do counseling, I said, when the people sit in my, my office and they sit at my desk, I don't care what the situation is. I'm going to say this. I'm not giving you Pastor Reeves advice. You know, my advice ain't worth anything. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I'm not, I, I don't have a magic wand or a happy pills in my desk. Hey, here you go. Here's some fairy dust. Go have fun. You know, I don't have any of that. I wish I could just take a magic wand out of my desk and say, here, your problems are all going away. I don't have that. You know, I don't have it. I, I'm not trying to make you feel good when you come into my office. What I'm going to do, and the only thing I'm going to do, is take out the word of God. That's it. I'm going to get, you know, and, and you have the choice whether to apply it to your life or not. I think a lot of people think when they come to pastoral counseling that they're going to go into and the room is going to be fi filled up with pixie dust and they're going to walk out and everything will be fine. No, the pastor's just writing a, a, a biblical prescription and you got the choice to fulfill it and apply it to your life. See, but when you go to somebody else and they're going to give you advice, always weigh it. Does it line up? with God's word because if it don't line up with God's word it's going to make you go astray and once you go astray it isn't going to be long before your faith Amen. is going to be shaken let me close with this in 2 Corinthians 5 7 popular verse for we walk by faith not by sight Christian faith is vital in all these things God sees the big picture he sees everything unfortunately we don't sometimes he's allowed things that we don't we don't understand sometimes he's got plans that we just don't see but in order for us to keep walking, we got to have faith that God is in, in, in the, on the throne. God is in control. But the moment we start, our faith starts to wander is the when we're going to mess up. Don't let these things, like Paul says, none of these things move me. Keep your eyes on the Word of God. Keep your eyes on the calling. And, and when you, then when you're done and you're at the end of this life and you're standing before the throne of God, that's the way you're going to hear, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Every head bowed and every eye closed. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you first this morning, are you saved? Do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt if you died today, heaven would be your home? With nobody looking around. This wasn't a salvation sermon. I'm I was talking to Christians this morning, but I'm going to ask you first, are you saved? Most important decision you ever make. Uh, yeah, whether you, you, you come to our church, whether you join our church, whatever. Salvation is the most important thing. Why? Because heaven is sweet and hell's hot. <laughs> you know, and if you die without Jesus Christ, you're going to split hell wide open for all eternity. Say, so are you trying to scare me, preacher? Yes. It's exactly what I'm trying to do. Because truth is truth. And you must be born again. Maybe you're here this morning and say, well, preacher, I don't know for sure if I'm saved. I don't know for sure if I died, I'd be in heaven. With every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you here this morning, say, well, preacher, that's me. I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you raise your hand up? I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you. I just all I'm going to do is pray for you. Say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not sure I'm saved. Anybody at all? Put her up and right back down. Amen. I don't see any hands. Christian, how's your faith this morning? Some things come in your life. It shook you up a little bit. Things got you a little sidetracked. You got your eyes on some things going on around you more than the eyes of the Lord. I'm going to challenge you this morning. I'm not going to draw out a long altar call. And I, and I can name a thousand things. But the word of God's been preached. Hopefully the Holy Spirit's moved in your heart. You know what we do things here. We set aside this time to deal business with God. Got an altar on the left, altar on the right, an opportunity. A lot, a lot of people like coming up and praying at the altar. I know I do. I like to pray at the altar. But if God's worked on your heart, why don't you come on up? Talk to God. You need to be saved? Come on up. We got people up here who love to show you out of the word of God how to be saved. 
you need to do business with God. I challenge you to come up to the altar, whether you sit in your pew, eh, eh, whatever. If you need to be saved, you can bow your head right there at your pew and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart and save me. And if you say that with faith, with faith, that you believe Jesus died and rose from the dead, he'll save you. How about you this morning? Why don't you come? You need to pray? Got something on your heart? The altar's open. How about you? Why don't you come? Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Lord, we can come to it and get so much comfort. And Lord, we know this life's not easy. Paul said that many times through Scripture. But Father, I pray and ask while we're here, help us to be ambassadors. Help us to be lighthouses. Lord, help us to win as many of the losses as we possibly can. Lord, we see heaven filled up. Lord, I'm thankful for the promise of heaven. Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, that one day we're going to be there and it's going to be reward time. But Father, we're here. Help us to be faithful servants of what you've called us to do. Lord, help us to watch our testimony, stay out of sin, be useful vessels for you. And Lord, that we'd be a lighthouse here in Rising Sun. We see many saved in this area. Father, we love you with all our heart. Bless the rest of this Lord's Day. Get us back tonight at 5 o'clock. Lord, we dig back in your word and study the topic at hand. And Father, I, pray, I didn't see any hands raised for salvation. If somebody here this morning is not saved, I pray and ask today they would call on you before they leave this place. Get with me and we can show, show them how to be saved. And Father, we just love you with all our heart. Lord, bless us as we go now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, don't forget, 5 o'clock, be here. Uh, gonna have, it's going to be a fun study. I, really, yeah, you're going to have fun. Just bring your King James, a notepad, a pencil, and uh, we're going to take some notes, have a lot of fun. I got donuts and a pumpkin spice roll. I ate three of the donuts this morning for breakfast, so there's three. We had 12, we got nine. <laughs> Nancy jumped all over me this morning. She said, are you serious? I can't take nine donuts. I'm like, hey. You know? <laughs> I was weak. I had a weak moment. Coffee and donuts just go so good together. Anyway, be here. We're going to have fun uh, at 5 o'clock. And uh, we're in heart before we go. Safe, secure. You can rest and show that the blood.